Uh, on behalf of President Hayes, the Sisters of St. Joseph of Boston, the First Year Seminar faculty, our Common Read Committee, and our Mission Committee, that's a lot of people, welcome to Heritage Week and our signature event. I think it's important for us as we begin to reflect on the weather outside. It's been snowy, it's been a difficult week, but we have some guests here from California who have brought the sunshine. We were laughing as we were heading down from College Hall and walking down that they needed to take a moment to put on their coats and bundle up when the rest of us New Englanders just walked out in shirt and pants and that was all we needed. But uh, it's, it's important for us also to understand the importance of today in terms of Heritage Week and what we think about when we celebrate Heritage Week. And I wanted to take just a quick moment to acknowledge the Sisters of St. Joseph of Boston and those who join us today. Heritage Week is a celebration of your work, your history, your heritage, and most importantly, the role we all play in carrying forward your values and your incredible le legacy. Thank you to our Sisters of St. Joseph. Each year, we select a book for a common read. And the book we select is, des is designed to provide new students with a common intellectual experience and to foster conversation and community building throughout the university. Tattoos on the Heart was our selection this year, and it pr proved to be an essential tool, allowing students to develop a deeper understanding of the tenets of Catholic social teaching and what it truly looks like to live the values of the Sisters of St. Joseph. We thank you, Father Greg, William, and DeAndre, for your stories and for coming to Regis today. Before we begin, I want to take care of a few housekeeping items. First, can you please silence your cell phones and put those away? We're going to be recording this event, thanks Peter Schipoletti, so if you need to remember it at all, you can check the, on the live stream or what we're going to have posted on our Vimeo and YouTube sites. Following Father Greg's talk, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. So please don't be shy. We'll have microphones circulating in the audience. Raise your hand if you have a question for Father Greg, William, or DeAndre. And last but not least, at the end of the program today, we're going to have some Regis students come up and provide some gifts to our wonderful guests. Let's begin. To introduce our special guest today is someone who is very special in her own right. Regis alum, Los Angeles native, and a graduate intern in our Center for Ministry and Service, Karen Marquez. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen Marquez. Um, I'm a graduate intern for the Center for Ministry and Service. I have been honored with knowing and learning about Father Greg since the year 2000, when I arrived to Dolores Mission School at the age of five. Growing up in Los Angeles, especially in the Boyle Heights community, has been and continues to be a huge privilege to me. I remember growing up and always hearing stories about Father G, admiring his presence when he would come to Dolores Mission Parish to visit or to occasionally do a Mass. Father Greg has been such an inspiration and guiding force in the Boyle Heights community and in my Dolores Mission community as well. Father G, G Dog, as the homies call him, has provided such life-changing opportunities for the brown and black women and men of Los Angeles and beyond. Through all the adversities the homies and Father G have encountered, they have pushed through and have proved their strength as an organization. With the help of those who support and believe in the vision and mission of Homeboy Industries, they have now become one of the largest gang intervention programs in the country. Being able to bring Regis students to Los Angeles to experience the spirit of Homeboy firsthand has been such a blessing and privilege. And now I am incredibly honored to welcome Father Greg to Regis. I would like everyone to give a huge and warm Regis welcome to Will, DeAndre, and Father G, a man who has dedicated his whole life to those who have gone through life misunderstood and abandoned by society. Father Greg Boyle and the homies. Uh, 
Um, will and DeAndre will be sharing their stories first. Thank you. And I want to say I really appreciate the welcome you guys have given us. And it, it really hits the heart. I sit here and tell you my story. I really feel at this point in my life that when it comes to change, that my name is right there next to the definition of change. I came a long way. I started going to Father Greg's office about 15, 16 years ago. I was real young, and I was real hard-headed. Didn't want to listen. He always told me, mijo, slow down. Come into the office. I'll help you out. I need, you, need, you need to get a job. I didn't care about none of that stuff. All I wanted to do was gangbang and sell drugs, do things of that nature, break my family's heart, my mother's heart. If I would listened to Father Greg a long time ago, I would have I kept, I kept a lot of pain from, from, from the hearts of my families and the ones that love me. I didn't want to listen to nobody, though. Now, I sit here, it's been a long time. I, I, feel, I went to Father G when I came home this time, and I told him, you know what, G-Dog, I'm ready to change. I need, a, I need a job, I need to work, I need to work on myself, I want to go back to school, I want to do all these things. And he said, show me, Mio, show me. And I, he brought me over here with him because he sees that I am, I am actually changing, you know, and um, it, it, it's not easy. It, it was never easy for me, you know. You know, the homies always call me, hey, come on, come down, let's go do this, let's go do that. I'm cool. I don't want to go back to my old hood. I don't want to go back to none of that stuff because all it, all it does is get you caught up. You know, uh, growing up, growing up, my, my, my pops was in there, you know. A lot of people probably don't have all that. My pops was in there. My, my mom raised me by herself. She did the best she can. But my mom was working until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So when she's, done, when she's at work, or when, I'm come, when I come home from school, I'm gone. I'm hitting the streets, you know. I'm running around. I'm doing all these things that I ain't supposed to do. And uh, we didn't, money, money, was, money was short in our house, so I found out ways to get my own money, get my own things, see? People had new, nice shoes, people had nice, nice Levi's and all that stuff. I wanted that stuff, too. I didn't want to get a job, though. So I used to go and do things I wasn't supposed to do, you know? And I, I caused my family a lot of pain. Like I said one, before, I said it again, you know? Because that's, that's really what it's about, you know? you know? When you're doing all that stuff, when I'm doing all those things in my, my life, I'm not sitting here thinking about all the stuff, that I, the, all, the, all the pain that I'm causing them. I don't care about nobody else. I'm being selfish, you know, and now I get older and I'm mature and I, I sit back and I, I realize, man, I, I hurt everybody, you know. I didn't care about what nobody did, what nobody thought, what nobody wanted me to do, you know. My mom, my mom's already old, 73 years old. Before she passes, I just wanted her to be proud of me, you know. And before I, before I come over, you know, she told me that. She told me she was proud of me. And it meant a lot to me, you know. When my father Jesus says he's proud of me, it means a lot to me, you know. I think it's ready, G. <laughs> All right, well, once again, I want to thank you guys for having us here and the welcome. Looking at this clock, and it's about to be five minutes right now. <laughs> I'm going to pass it on to DeAndre. Thank you, thank you again. I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is DeAndre. My story is I had a rough life as a kid, and it um, it messed with me. So um, I really had no family like that. Um, I did have it, but my mom had a lot of kids, so she more favored the other kids than me. So I just went to the streets, and uh, all I knew was Pasadena um, um, blood. So I ran to them. They treated me like they loved me, like the like my mom's supposed to love me, you know? Well, I thought they loved me like my mom's supposed to love me, but I was fooled until I started getting older. Uh, I'm catching cases, going to Juno Hall, then Juno Hall led up to placements, and placements led up to um, prison. And I get out, I do good for a little bit, then I slide back to the hood and start game banging again. Then I went to Homeboys. And when I went to Homeboys, I thought I wanted to change. But I did not. I was playing myself. And uh, Father G opened my eyes and told me, son, it's time for the change. Do it for, for yourself and your children. I have four kids, and they love me. And they always want me to stay out of jail. But I try to do the right thing, but I always run back to the streets because that's all I know. So I got locked up again. 
The second time I come to Homeboys Industries, Father G say, are you ready? I said, I'm ready. So, so now I'm working. I got my kids, take care of my kids. It's hard to be a parent because you don't know how to be a parent. I wasn't raised with my parents, but I tell my kids, work with me and I work with you. Like I have a 14 year old daughter, man. <laughs> <laughs> she crazy, like, you know what I mean? And I, I'm like, man, how can I handle her? You know what I mean? She 14 at the stage, going, leaving and I try to run away and I'm like, man, how can I deal with this problem? So I sit there and talk to her and she said, how can you tell me something and you used to do that and you was in prison half of your life? I said, babe, what I done, I made a big mistake, but now today I'm trying to fix it. And she say, well, fix your problem, then talk to me later. I'm like, huh? <laughs> I'm like, he wrote rude and disrespectful. Uh, I said, well, I take her phone away. Uh, she said, um, I get another phone. I'm like, oh, okay. Well. So I'm like, my son, he's a good football player. I go watch him play football. Um, now that I, my 14 year old daughter, I talked to her, right? I guess when I was talking to her, I wasn't talking to her like a parent supposed to talk to. I was talking to her like real loud and, and she didn't understand that. But now when I talk to her correctly and really talk to her and ask her how she feel, other, how she feel today and respect her, she talked to me more and respect me. So as long as I got my kids in my life and fighting for me and I'm fighting for myself and I'm fighting for them, I'm going to be on the right track. But every time I go to Pasadena, I live right across the street from the hood. So I'm like, man, should I go to the park today? So I'm like, nah, I'll just stay in the house this weekend. You know, just attend to my kids. Or I call Father G, I, Father G, I think I'm going back. And he just texts me like, son, it's gonna be okay. Just breathe, pray, breathe. It's gonna be all right. And I respect everybody at home, boys, because they battle for me. Uh, they want me to do good. They want to see me do good. They know how I was before, and this time I'm changing a lot. And I appreciate my life more better now, too, as being a man instead of a gang member. That's it. I love you guys. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here with you and uh, to be with uh, DeAndre and William. We went to Legal Seafood last night, and they had their first lobsters, and uh, it was great to see homies wearing bibs. So, uh, uh, It's uh, the privilege of my life uh, to, uh, for 34 years to have worked with gang members, and so... Uh, the day won't ever come when I have more courage or I am more noble or I'm closer to God than uh, these two, sipping on his Dunkin' Donuts uh, coffee. <laughs> Thank you for whoever did that. So somebody went and got him that. Um, uh, people like Louis Perez, we were talking about him last night, he's kind of a force of nature who worked at Homeboy for a time, um, did a lot of things, but he was also a kind of a public speaker and and he liked doing it. He was starting to be in great in demand. And he and I, we went out to dinner, and he was giving me tips on how to speak publicly. And he said, you know, you have to pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. <laughs> I said, yeah, no shit. Uh, <laughs> that's good advice there. So brace yourselves. You know, uh, what Martin Luther King says about church could well be said about your time here at Regis. It's not the place you've come to, it's the place you go from. And you go from here uh, to imagine a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it. You want to, with God, imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle 
And to that end, you want to dismantle the barriers that exclude. Regis is not the place you've come to, it's the place you go from, and you go from here to stand at the margins, as Pope Francis tells us to do. Because unless you stand at the margins, they don't get erased unless you stand there. And you stand with a particularity, with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. You stand with those whose dignity has been denied. And you stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. And every once in a while, you have this exquisite privilege to be able to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out, with the demonized, so that the demonizing will stop. And you get to stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. And I suspect if kinship and the creation of a community of kinship was our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice, we'd be celebrating it. Because no kinship, no peace, no kinship, no justice, no kinship, no equality, no matter how singularly focused we may well be on those worthy goals, they actually can't happen unless there's some undergirding sense that we are connected. As Mother Teresa diagnosed the world's ills correctly, I think, when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? Regis is not the place you've come to, it's the place you go from. And you go to the margins and you brace yourselves because people will accuse you of wasting your time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. You go to the margins and other voices get heard. So the homies have taught me everything of value. They've taught me what kinship is about, and uh, I'm indebted to them. But one of the things they've taught me in the last number of years is how to text, and I'm so grateful to them because <laughs> I find it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. And, and I'm pretty good at this, pretty dexterous, you know, LOL and OMG and BTW. A homie taught me a new one just yesterday, SMH. I'd never heard of that. <laughs> I said, you've used it nine times in this text. What the hell does it mean? He goes, shaking my head, so SMH. He taught me a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh, hell no, <laughs> which I have been using quite a bit lately. Uh, but I'm sure I'm not alone in being vexed by this autocorrect thing. Uh, I had a homegirl named Bertha, kind of a tough cookie, who... Uh, uh, on a Sunday, she texted me and she said, where are you at? And I texted her back, I'm about to speak to a room full of monjas, sisters, nuns, religious women, I'm about to speak to a room full of monjas, and I pushed send, and autocorrect told her that I was about to speak to a room full of ninjas, <laughs> which she thought was pretty darn interesting. The homies even now uh, are texting, blowing up my phone, their hair on fire, uh, because they need money. And so, you know, they're going to cut off my lights or my car note is due or I don't I have to get my tags or whatever it is. Uh, so a homie texted me and, and he said he needed $100 uh, to finish off his rent and I didn't have it. So I wrote back, things are tight. And I pushed send and autocorrect told him, thongs are tight. <laughs> And he wrote back, sorry to hear that. <coughs> uh, what about my rent? Uh, so there I am in a car with two older vatos, homies who work at Homeboy named Manuel and Poncho. And, uh, and, you know, they do a variety of things at Homeboy, and they're going to help me give a talk just like these two gentlemen at a high school in Palm Desert near Palm Springs, about two hours away. And so uh, we have morning meeting as was mentioned somebody had been, the group of students here had been to that, and, and then we got in the car about 9 o'clock, and so we were about 15 minutes on the road when 
Manuel in the front seat gets an incoming, and he reads it to himself, and he chuckles. And I said, what is it? And he goes, oh, it's dumb. It's from Snoopy back at the office. Well, I'd just seen Snoopy. Snoopy gave me a big abrazo as the day was beginning. Snoopy and Manuel worked together in the clock-in room, where they clock in hundreds and hundreds of our workers, all gang members. Not a job I would want, because this may come as a surprise. Uh, gang members can occasionally be attitudinal, so... Um, I'm glad I don't have that job. And so I said, well, what's he say? And he goes, uh, oh, it's dumb. Hang on, let me find it. Hey, uh, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. <laughs> you have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> well, we died laughing, and I almost drove into oncoming traffic when... <laughs> When I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies, they're from rival gangs, they used to shoot bullets at each other, because I remember. Now they shoot text messages, and there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. How do we obliterate once and for all the illusion that we are separate, that there is an us and a them? How do we bridge the distance even in our own service? Regis is not the place you've come to, it's the place you go from. And you go from here to dedicate yourself to the beloved neighbor and to love without distinction. But there's even a distance in service, you know, service provider, service recipient. And uh, so that's a a distance that you want to bridge. You don't want to have any distance that separates us. At Homeboy Industries, I'm not the great healer, and these gang members over here are in need of my exquisite healing. The truth be told, we're all a cry for help. We're all in need of healing. It's one of the things that joins us together as members of the human family. One of the great privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez as a friend, and uh, he was the best listener I've ever encountered in my life. If you were talking to him, nobody else existed. He was always laser beam focused. He was never looking over your shoulder to see if someone more important was on the approach. But quite famously, uh, a reporter had commented to him and said, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And uh, Cesar just shrugged and smiled and says, the feeling's mutual. And of course it is. How do we arrive at this exquisite mutuality that joins us together? Because service is where you begin, but it's not where you end. Service is the hallway that gets you to the ballroom, and you want to get to the ballroom, the place of connection. Regis is not the place you've come to, but it's the place you go from so that you can be connected in that way. I was in Houston not long ago, and I was talking to a, a hardcore gang intervention worker, a former gang member himself, working on the streets and, and trying to help homies. And, and he pleaded with me, how do you reach them? And I said, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? And that's the whole nine yardas. You know, you want to be reached by the folks at the margins. You don't go to the margins to make a difference. You don't go to Peru to make a difference or to come visit Homeboy to make a difference. You go to the margins so that the folks at the margins make you different. And after having lunch with your students here, that's exactly what's happened at places like Peru and in uh, in Los Angeles, when you came to visit Homeboy, you receive people, and suddenly everybody inhabits their own nobility. But you want to bridge the distance between service provider and service recipient. Uh, there was a homie, uh, a guy named Dreamer. Nobody found more job opportunities than this guy. Uh, he was probably, uh, he beats William by a long shot, you know, and uh, he was... Uh, uh, he's in his 40s now doing well, married, has a house, and in the construction biz. But he grew up in the projects, and 
And uh, very smart kid, super intelligent. Uh, though I don't recall that he ever actually went to school, but he was smart. He had a dangerous sense of humor that I always enjoyed. And, but in his early 20s, he was a yo-yo. He was in and out of getting locked up, and he would, um, you know, I'd find him a job in the private sector or in one of our businesses. And, but then he'd always wander back to vague criminality, usually something involving drugs, the sale of, or the use of, and then he'd wander back to me. So it was a pattern that was very frustrating. And so uh, there he was, uh, after finishing a four-month stretch probation violation in county jail, sitting in front of my desk. And he says what gang members often say. He says, this time, it'll be different. And I said, mm, all right. So I picked up the phone, and I called a friend of mine named Gary, who runs a vending machine company in Alhambra, California. And Gary had hired homies in the past, and I'm hoping against hope maybe he'll do it again. And sure enough, he says, you tell that guy he can start tomorrow. That's a holy man right there. So Dreamer began work the next day at the vending machine company. But two weeks later, there he is again in front of my desk. I, I couldn't even believe my eyeballs. I said, híjole madre santa, here we go all over again. But this time he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out his very first paycheck and he waves it proudly and he says, damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. I mean, my mom, she's proud of me and my kids, they're not ashamed of me. And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I say, well, gosh. <laughs> who? And he looks at me strangely, and he says, well, God, of course. And I say, oh, sure, no, that's right. That, that would be God. You thought I was going to say you. I said, no, gosh, God's number one. <laughs> he said, you are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days. I'm sorry, them Genesis days? He goes, yeah, because God would have been had Struck down your ass already by now. <clears throat> well, I guess he told me, but we just fell out of our chairs. We were howling with laughter. And I defy you to identify exactly who's the service provider and who's the service recipient. It's mutual. Old Boy Industries was born a long time ago, 1988, during the time I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, Karen mentioned Dolores Mission, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village, and together they comprised the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. We had eight gangs at war with each other, so the LAPD named that area in Los Angeles the place of the highest concentration of gang activity anywhere. So if LA was the gang capital of the world, my parish was the gang capital of Los Angeles. Uh, in LA County, we have 120,000 gang members and 1,100 gangs. So I buried my first young person in 1988, and I buried my 225th uh, two months ago. Not all from that community, but I know a lot of gang members. I get asked to do this. So the first thing we did was we started a school because there were so many junior high, middle school age gang members who had been given the boot from their home school. Nobody wanted them, so they were wreaking havoc in the projects. They were selling drugs, they were violent, they were riding on walls. So I walked out to them, and I would corner them. I'd say, hey, you know, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, they all said yes, and then I couldn't find a school that would take them, so that kind of forced my hand. So right across the street from the church is... Um, our elementary school, our parochial school, and uh, first two floors are uh, K to eight, but the entire third floor was the convent where the ninjas lived, and uh, so I sat all the nuns down on the third floor and in the living room, and I said, hey, you know, would you guys mind, you know, moving out, and, uh, <laughs> and we could turn the convent into a school for gang members. So they looked at each other and they said, sure. That was the extent of their discernment process. 
And uh, so gang members came in large numbers to the church property, uh, which created kind of a disconnect. People in the parish started to question, aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed? You know, good people in and bad people out. So it was a good gospel uh, challenge about who is our dear neighbor. And so the gang member said, if only we had jobs. And so uh, myself and the women, we marched around the housing projects, the factories that surrounded the projects, trying to find felony-friendly employers. And that wasn't so forthcoming. So we invented things. We started things like the homeboy maintenance crew and the landscaping crew and <clears throat> the graffiti removal crew, a crew to build our child care center, all made up of rival enemy gang members. Then in 1992, after the Rodney King verdict, the whole city of Los Angeles exploded. Every pocket of poverty exploded except uh, the most uh, impoverished pocket, which was my parish. And so the LA Times wanted to know why that was, and so they asked me, and I said, well, I think it's because we had 60 strategically hired gang members, maybe the most likely to ignite their own community, and they had a reason to get up in the morning and a reason not to gangbang and more to the point, a reason not to torch their own community. So a movie producer named Ray Stark read this in the LA Times. He happened to have $500 million. And he summoned me to his office in Beverly Hills. And he looked at me and he said, how should I use my money? I look back now and I, I woefully undershot my request here, but I was young. And I said, uh, well, there's an abandoned bakery right across the street from the school. It has ovens. We could put hairnets on gang members. We could, they could bake bread, and we could call the place Homeboy Bakery. And that was the extent of my business plan. And he said, sure. So we were off and running. A month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market. Once we had plural, we changed our name from Jobs for a Future to Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this venture. Not everything worked. Homeboy Plumbing really was not hugely successful. Uh, who knew? Uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes. I <laughs> did not see that coming. And nobody ever intends to do such a thing, but we backed our way, evolved our way into becoming now the largest gang intervention rehab reentry program on our planet. 15,000 folks a year walk through our doors trying to reimagine their lives. Uh, most of them want to get into the 18 month program, which these two are in. And because uh, that's a paid gig. And uh, they, we have everything from anger management to like 40 classes, we still have a school, therapy, case management. Um, we have free tattoo removal. No place on the planet Earth removes more tattoos than we do. Um, we have a designated clinic with three laser machines. Um, we have one paid physician assistant and like 47 volunteer doctors, uh, 30,000 treatments a year. So if anybody's starting to regret that Regis tattoo you've got, <laughs> see me afterwards. Part of the thing about can you be reached by folks is to, you have to listen to people. In the gospel, it talks about uh, humility and hubris. Humility is the strategy of Jesus, where he can look to the poor, and his stance is, how can I help? What, what, what do you need? Hubris is the opposite, of course, that says, here's what your problem is. Here's what you need to fix. But if you listen, the folks at the margins will tell you what they need. And tattoo removal was born not because I thought it was a good idea, but because a guy named Frank came into my office, and uh, I'd never met him before, a gang member straight out of Corcoran State Prison, two days out of prison, and he's sitting in front of my desk and tattooed on his forehead like a big old damn billboard filling the whole space, pardon my French, it said, fuck the world, filled the whole forehead. 
And he looked at me and he said, you know, I am having a hard time finding a job. <laughs> I said, well, Frank, maybe we could put our heads together on this one. And, and I'm thinking, where can I send him? You know, like to McDonald's or, you know, do you want fries with that? No, I don't want fries. Mothers clutching their kids running out of the store. So naturally, I hired him. And he worked at the bakery and he was bagging bread. And I went looking for a doctor who could help, and I found a dermatologist at White Memorial Hospital. He had a laser machine, and so he uh, chipped away. He donated one hour a month and to chip away at Frank's forehead and a handful of others. And then, uh, before too long, I had a waiting list of 3,000 gang members who wanted the same service. So I couldn't really stay with that arrangement. Parentheses, Frank is uh, currently a security guard uh, at a movie studio in Hollywood, and there is no trace left of the angriest, dumbest thing that Frank had ever done, proving once and for all what Sister Helen Prejean often says, all of us are a whole lot more than the worst things we've ever done. So then we have our nine uh, social enterprises. The Homeboy Bakery is thriving. Homeboy Homegirl Merchandise, where we sell our logo stuff. Um, <clears throat> Homeboy Diner, which is the only place you can get food in City Hall in Los Angeles. We have a restaurant at Terminal 4, American Airlines at LAX. Uh, farmers Markets. Um, we have, what else, what else am I missing? Uh, uh, we have the solar panel training, thank you. We have recycling, Homeboy Recycling, which is uh, e-waste, uh, farmer's markets. What else, DeAndre, pay attention. Um, <laughs> what else am I missing? Homegirl Cafe, where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude, will gladly take your order. <laughs> and they cater. Uh, how many of you here have been to Homegirl Cafe? I know the front row has. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a who's who. If you go there, you're going to bump into celebs or elected officials, you know, uh, Jim Carrey, um, Jack Black, Forrest Whitaker. Um, once with only two hours' notice, uh, we got a phone call from the Secret Service saying that uh, Vice President Joe Biden, when he was Vice President, uh, wanted to visit. Uh, the famous homegirl cafe, and so they had the motorcade and entourage and selfies with Uncle Joe. And I was making my annual eight-day silent retreat, so I wasn't there. But when I got back, Louis Mora was giving me uh, the rundown, and uh, he's a trainee there. And he said, "Damn, gee, while you were gone, we were visited by an MVP." I said, "Do you mean a VIP?" He goes, "Yeah, that one, a VIP." Damn, gee, imagine we were visited here at Homeboy Industries by the Vice President of the United States, Mick Romney. <laughs> <clears throat> so I think you can file that one under all white guys look alike. But uh, <laughs> so I think we added a current affairs class shortly thereafter. But most famously of all, Diane Keaton showed up for lunch, Oscar winner, Annie Hall, Godfather movies, big movie star. Her waitress is Glenda, and Glenda's a big girl, been there, done that, tattooed, felon, parolee, gang member. She has no clue who Diane Keaton is, and so she's taking her order, and Diane Keaton says, well, what do you recommend? And Glenda rattles off the three dishes she particularly likes, and... Uh, Diane Keaton says, well, I'll have that second one. That one sounds good. And, and it's at that moment, for some reason, something dawns on Glinda. She looks at Diane Keaton. She says, wait a minute. I feel like I know you from somewhere. You know, like maybe we've met. And Diane Keaton decides to deflect it humbly. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I suppose I have one of those faces that people think they've seen before. And, and Glinda goes, no, now I know <laughs> We were locked up together. <laughs> yeah, that just took my breath away when I heard it, and I don't believe we've had any further Diane Keaton sightings now that I think of it. But suddenly, kinship so quickly, Oscar-winning actress, attitudinal waitress, exactly what God had in mind, and 
we could well ask ourselves, what is on God's mind? Well, Jesus tells us pretty clearly that you may be one. I suppose he could have been more self-referential, but it's really about us. All of us are called to be what to, called to be enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused, attentive love return people to themselves. At Homeboy, we're kind of allergic to the notion of holding the bar up and asking folks to measure up. Instead, we hold the mirror up and tell people the truth, knowing that my truth is your truth and your truth is a gang member's truth, and it's all the same truth, and here's the truth. You are exactly what God had in mind when God made you. And once folks on the margins know that truth, they become that truth, they inhabit that truth, and no bullet can pierce it, no four prison walls can keep it out, and death can't touch it because it's huge, but all of us have to reach in and dismantle the messages of shame and disgrace that get in the way that keep people from seeing their truth. In the Acts of the Apostles, it has this one curious line, and it says, and awe came upon everyone. It seems to suggest that the measure of health in any community, including this one, may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry, rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. I, uh, every weekend I say masses in probation camps, detention facilities, and then I race back to Dolores Mission because I've been there for 30 years and I know everybody and people, homies especially, want me to, to do things for them, so it's always every Saturday's the same. One o'clock baptism, two o'clock quinceanera when a girl turns 15, three o'clock wedding, four o'clock exorcism. <laughs> Just checking to see if you're still listening to me. <laughs> I've never done one of those. But one day I raced home after doing mass at a probation camp, and it was like 12.30, and I thought, well, I have time to go to my office on First Street and go through my mail. So I'm over there, contento, feliz, all by myself, going through the mail, when all of a sudden this woman walks in, her name is Lisa, I find out. This is the first time she's ever stepped foot in my office, and Lisa's kind of uh, famous on First Street, prostitute, gang member, heroin addict. The homies call her La Gritona because she's always screaming. She's screaming at the guy who tosses her out of the bar next door. She screams into a payphone at the top of her lungs, let me just stay tonight, pleading with relatives, friends. And this is the first time she's ever stepped foot in my office. And now I have 10 minutes till my baptism at one. She comes into my inner sanctum and she plunks herself down and she launches right in, I need help. Oh, I've been to like 50 rehabs. I'm known all over nationwide. I graduated from Catholic schools all my life. Graduated from elementary. I even graduated from Sacred Heart in Lincoln Heights. And then she gets quiet and she says, the first time I ever used heroin was right after I graduated. And I've been trying to stop since the moment I began. And I watched as she leaned her head against the wall behind her and her two eyes became like ponds, water rising to meet its edges and spilling over. And she cried and she cried until she leveled her gaze at me and she said with great deliberation, I am a disgrace. And suddenly her shame met mine. 
for when I had seen her step into my office that day, I had mistaken her for an interruption. And awe came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. For the truth of the matter is, if we don't welcome our own wounds, we may well be tempted to despise the wounded. Let me end with this story so I can go back to that chair in the middle and take your questions. Homies uh, come to Homeboy freely. Our program is not for those who need help, it's only for those who want it. And both these guys know that uh, it takes what it takes for somebody to want help. They'll come in and they'll say, uh, you know, I'm ready, ready, ready. And I'll say, okay, uh, I have an opening in the bakery, but you have to work with X, Y, and Z, and I rattle off the names of rivals. And they always think about it for a while, and then they'll say, okay, I'll work with them. I'm not going to talk to them. And I remember how much that bothered me in the early days until you discover that you cannot demonize somebody you know. Humans can't pull that off. So I had a homie named Youngster, 19 years old. And uh, I'd known him in the projects. I thought he was ready. He's a little chaparito. And so I, I take him to Homeboy um, uh, Silkscreen, which is our largest business, been around for like 24 years. Thousands of enemy rival gang members have worked there over this time. We have like 2,500 customers from all over the world. High quality work, reasonably priced. We UPS to Weston. I'm just saying. So I bring uh, youngster into the silkscreen to introduce him to his some 30 coworkers, <clears throat> and I watch him as he shakes hands. Most of them are enemies, and firm handshake, and he looks them in the eyes, and I think, wow, this is great. Until he gets to the last guy, a guy named Puppet, and when Puppet and youngster are in the each other's vicinity, they mumble something, they stare at their shoes, they don't shake hands. Well, I know they're enemies, but he just shook hands with a whole bunch of enemies. I discover later that this is a hatred that's really quite personal, beyond which neither of them think they can get past. So I sensed that much at the moment. I said, look, you know, if you can't hang working together, let me know I got a bunch of people who want this job and they don't say a word. Six months later, Puppet leaves his home to go to a corner store some distance from his house, and he purchases something, but on the way home, for some reason, he decides to take a shortcut, so he dodges into an alley, and because he took this detour, suddenly, unexpectedly, he's surrounded by 10 members of a rival gang, 10 against one, and they beat him badly. And he falls to the ground, and while he's lying there, these guys just won't stop kicking his head until he's lifeless. Somebody finds his body and takes him to White Memorial Hospital, where he's declared effectively brain dead. But it's the policy there to keep you connected to machines for 48 hours so that you have two straight days of what they call a flat read, where there is no brain activity. And once it's flat for two days, the doctors can sign the death certificate and make it official. This allowed family and friends to gather. I was in St. Louis giving a talk. I flew home uh, right away. I've seen a lot of horrible things in my life, but nothing to compare to the sight of this young man with his head swollen many times its size. It was uh, horrifying. You could barely train your eyes on him. So at the end of the, 20, the 48 hours, as a priest, I said a blessing prayer. I anointed his forehead. We disconnected, and I buried him a week later. 
But in the first 24 hours, as he was lying there beaten, I was alone in my office. It was 8.30 at night, and the phone rings, and it's youngster, Puppet's co-worker from the silkscreen factory. And he said, uh, hey, that's messed up about what happened to Puppet. And I said, yeah, it is. And then with a certain eagerness even, he said, is there anything I can do? Can I give him my blood? And we both fall silent under the weight of it until finally he chokes back his tears until he can finally say, he was not my enemy. He was my friend. We worked together. Now, can I say that always happens at Homeboy? Yeah, of course. Any exceptions? No, I can't think of a single one. And it shouldn't surprise us that God's own dream come true for us, that we be one, just happens to be our own deepest longing for ourselves. For it turns out, it's mutual. Regis is not the place you've come to. It's always been the place you'll, you will go from. And you go from here to create a community of kinship such that God might recognize it. And pretty soon you cease to care whether anyone accuses you of wasting your time. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. You go from here to the margins not to make a difference, but so that the folks at the margins make us different. Thank you very much. Special thanks to William, DeAndre, and Father Greg. We have a few minutes remaining for your questions, so if you do have a question, please raise your hand. We've got mics in the audience that will come to you, and then uh, we'll, and if you want to address your question to one of our guests, that would be a probably helpful thing. But any questions from the audience? Okay, I can't see anybody, but... Uh... Hello? Okay, it's working. Um, hi, my name's uh, Alex, and my question is for um, Father Boyle. What's the most thing that you're proud of about Homeboy Industries? What's the thing that I'm most proud of about Homeboy Industries? You know, I, I don't do pride. I don't do success. I don't do accomplishments. I don't do legacy. The list is long of the things I don't do, you know? Because for me, it's like... Uh, it's about the luminous now. It's like being right here with these two characters. It's about being proud of them. And so I don't really think in those terms because then, then you think in terms of failure and defeat and, and uh, rejection or setbacks, and I don't think in those terms either. Mother Teresa says that we're not called to be successful. We're called to be faithful. So if, if we're faithful, then we're anchored in the present moment. We're not lamenting what happened yesterday, and we're not anxious about tomorrow. We're right here in the luminous now. And the thing that kind of propels us to this place is tenderness. And Homeboy is a community of tenderness. And tenderness is the highest form of spiritual maturity. Because if love is the answer... Community is the context, but tenderness is the methodology. 
And uh, otherwise, love stays in your head or in the ether or even in your heart. But unless it becomes tender, it's not connective tissue. And at Homeboy, and I know the folks who've been there, you experience this. You felt it. It's visceral. You walk in, and of course, you know that it's African-American gang members, Latino gang members, the occasional white guy, you know, and, um, and so... And we're connected. It's tender. And it's powerful. And, uh, and only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any chance of changing the world. So that matters to me. Okay, got it. Hi, my name is Gabby, and my question is, in the last few years, with the rise of racial tensions in the U.S., has that in any part had an impact on your work? I can answer that. Um... At Homeboys Industries, um, we don't believe in um, racial. We believe in family. So anything like on the streets, anywhere, we ain't a part of it because we are family and we love each other. So it would never be no racial, like black and Mexican or white and Mexican or black. We don't do that because we are family. So we love each other. We, don't ain't, we ain't here to hurt nobody. Oh yeah, well, homeboy industry is no racial tension. I mean, everything gets left behind where where it gets left behind. When you're in we're homeboy industries, like like Father G said, whether you're rival gangs or or a different different color, we all work together and we're all there for the same thing. You know, everybody wants to change, everyone wants to get a job, maybe wants to take care of their family. So nobody wants to bump heads with the next person and get risk getting kicked out of there. So it, it's 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 not worth it. So ain't no racial tension in homeboy industries. Everything's good there. Hello. Um, so my question is for Father Greg. Um, I want to know how you stay, stayed grounded in your faith, even with all of the terrible things that you saw throughout your work. Uh, well, you know, you kind of, you want to just breathe in the spirit that delights in your being, then you want to breathe that out into the world. You want to um, kind of find the stillness in 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 God, and then you want to love in the stillness of God. So you, you want to, the more you can dedicate yourself to loving all the time, uh, then that keeps you in the luminous now. It keeps you right here. And, uh, and so you pray to do that, certainly. But it's a kind of a, a decision that you make. Uh, to be tender, to be tender, to be tender, and um, and it's the only loca- the only location for joy and happiness is right in this present moment. You really won't find it anywhere else. You're not going to find it tomorrow, and you, and you're not going to find it yesterday. You can only find it right now. I always talk about the living room, which is the living room, the place, the only place where joy and happiness kind of can be encountered, but we spend so much time in lament, say, in the bathroom, or, or in, with anxiety, say, in the kitchen, but, but we're always being propelled to kind of stay in the living room. What is the thing that keeps us in this luminous now? And it's really, it, it's, a, it's an intentionality, it's a consciousness, where you kind of say, I, I want to be right here and I don't want to be anywhere else. And then you can love uh, who you find in the present moment. And then the consciousness is about some other person. 
and, uh, and that's the center of your focus, and that's where joy and happiness is only available to us, no other place. Um, I have a question for the homeboys. Was there a moment for you guys that you kind of realized, like, this is it, I've done it, I've reached this point where there's, I'm not going to be going back, and you felt this, like, feeling of, like, this is my future, I can, like, I feel like I'm good. So there was there a moment when you, when you said, yes, Duval, that's it, I don't want any part of this anymore? Uh, I... I, I, I thought I thought that moment came lots of times in the past, but this time when I was released from prison, I did about uh, five years. I was gone from my family and I was pretty far away, and uh, I didn't get many visits, you know. And um, my mom was real old, and she wanted to visit me every every weekend. She wanted to try and visit me, or or every month she wanted to try and visit me. I never sent her a visit me form, so my mom was so old I didn't want her standing in line. You know, I didn't want her going. I didn't want her going through that no more. I didn't want her going through that hurtness. So uh, I, I, I just, I, I, I stood focused when I was in there. I worked out. I read out every book that I could, and I, I said that when I come home this time, I'm gonna make people proud instead of. Hey, my mom always hears the same thing. Why, why you always look out for him? Why you take care of him while he's in there? Let him, let him fend for himself. You keep, you keep making things easy for him while he's in there. And when he comes out, he wants to do the same thing because he's gonna go right back in there and he knows that he's gonna have it made. You know, let him hang, leave him hang. You know. My mom's family, her her sisters, my brothers, they tell her all that. And uh, I didn't want her to look stupid no more, you know. I wanted, I wanted to make her proud and let everybody see that, uh, that she didn't do it for no reason, that it, that it matters to me and that I do care. So this time when I came home, I, I like to say that this is the actual time that I said this time I'm going to change my life. Thank you. All right, the, one, the moment I woke me up was when um, last year when I found myself in a hospital and and I got shot in the hand and in my leg and I was like, oh my God, I have to wake up. I'm tired of living the way I'm living. So I got went to prison. Um, I had a lot of time to think. So when I got out, I believe in myself. So I took it to consideration and say. I always care for everybody else, but I don't care for myself. So I need to care for myself so I can do the right thing and stay out and get a job and take care of my children. And that's what I'm doing now today. To thank Father Greg, William, and DeAndre, I'd like to invite a few students up to the stage, please, to present a gift on behalf of the Regis community. They talked about their screen printing business. We got to make sure they have the appropriate Regis gear <laughs> to take back to them, so, take back with them to California. So, guys, let's get a photo of everyone. Take out your sweatshirts. Let's see it. And then, on behalf of the Regis community, and in honor of Heritage Day, the students of Regis have collected and are submitting a donation in the amount of nineteen hundred and twenty-seven dollars. Strangely enough, the year of our founding to Homeboy Industries. Thanks again to Homeboy Industries for coming to Regis. Let's give them one last round of applause.